For those of you who haven't been here before, what this whole talk is about or this whole series is about are where does life's compass point? What are the essentials really of Christianity? And the compass motif goes like this. If you got lost out in the woods and you had nothing but a magnetic compass to get back and you take out the magnetic compass and instead of pointing to magnetic north, the compass always points to you. How helpful would that compass be? Not going to be helpful at all, right? You already know where you are. You're trying to figure out where north is so you can get home. Well, the problem is, is many of us, even Christians, think that the compass of life always points to us. And if for some reason life isn't going the way we want it to go, either God doesn't exist or he's evil or he's forgotten about us. And what we're trying to show in this whole series is the compass doesn't point to us. The compass actually points to Jesus because he's the center of the entire Bible. He's the reason that there is a Bible at all. He's, he's the reason, of course, we exist. And the handout I gave you has this big picture of what the entire Bible is pretty much about. You have a creation. We don't know how far back that was. Christians argue over that. We went through that a few sessions ago. And then, say, around 2166 or so, you've got the patriarchs beginning. Who are the patriarchs? Well, before the patriarchs, you had Adam, Eve, Noah, that whole thing. Then you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all three major monotheistic religions start with Abraham. They all claim Abraham as their, their, their guy, their lead guy. The Muslims claim it, the Jews claim it, the Christians claim Abraham is the lead guy. And then from 2166 or so when Abraham was born, you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The entire book of Genesis is about this period. The Jews wind up in slavery in Egypt and about 1446 B.C., the exodus begins. After being 400 years in slavery, led, of course, by Moses, uh, and you have characters like Aaron and Pharaoh in there, that it takes 40 years in the wilderness. And my contention is, and others like my friend Bob Cornuke, the real Indiana Jones, says they did not wander on the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. They wandered on the Saudi Peninsula for 40 years. You couldn't wander for 40 years in the Sinai Peninsula. That'd be like wandering in New Jersey for 40 years. You don't have, you, you, you'd wander out of there, okay? <laughs> you'd wander out of there. No, if you really look at the biblical text and the archaeological evidence, the real Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. It's Jabal al-Laws, the mountain of almonds, right next to Jabal al-Musa, the mountain of Moses. And uh, there's a great documentary on this. My friend Bob Cornuke is a part of it. It's called The Mountain of Fire. You can look it up. It's either called The Mountain of Fire or The Mountain of God. Anyway, very interesting stuff. The real Mount Sinai is right where Paul says it was, in Arabia. So it's across the Gulf of Aquaba. All right, that's where the real Mount Sinai is. They wandered in there for 40 years. They come into the Promised Land in 1406. The whole Jericho story, you know all that, by the way, if we go to Israel, you'll go to Jericho. You'll see the oldest city in the world, it's Jericho. Still there, the mound, you're, you're standing on history when you're standing on that tell right there. You've got Joshua, Caleb, Rahab, those kinds of characters in that time. Then you've got a period of, uh, after the conquest, you have a period of judges that goes on for almost 300 years. And the theme of the book of the judges is what? The very end of the book of Judges? When they don't really have a king, they just have all these tribes. The theme is, and everyone did what, did what was right in his own eyes. That's how the, the book ends. It was kind of a very turbulent period. A lot of different tribes, a lot of crazy things going on in the book of Judges. They finally get a king. They want a king for the entire Israel. Who do they get first? Who's their first king? Saul. That's Saul. Okay. They wanted somebody handsome and tall, so they got Saul. And it didn't really work out. God wanted to be their king, but okay, you want, a, you want an earthly king? Here's Saul. And then, of course, after Saul, you have David and Solomon. And the kingdom lasts 119 years to 931. And then at that point, after Solomon dies, he has two sons. The kingdom splits. You've got a northern kingdom, Israel. You've got a southern kingdom, Judah. The northern kingdom is taken out by the Assyrians in 722. You have prophets like Jonah, Hosea, and Isaiah who are claiming, come back to the Lord, come back to the Lord, northern kingdom. You're away from the Lord. And they're finally judged. The southern kingdom of Judah, from where we get the term Jew, 
actually is taken out by the Babylonians in 586. We talked about that last year when we were talking about Daniel, because Daniel was involved in being in Babylon. You have Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. Those are the kind of prophets dealing in these times. And then after the 70-year captivity, you have the return back to the land. Well, you have characters like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. After that, after they return to the land, you have 400 years of silence from 400 B.C. to Jesus' time. Then once Jesus shows up with Mary, John the Baptist, he's probably born in about 4 B.C. He, of course, is, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected. The cross is the center of the entire Bible and uh, then we have the mission, which includes the apostles, the church, means uh, the group of believers, and that's me and you. And ultimately, we're going to wind up in eternity. So that's kind of the big picture. And all of this right here is intervention. Creation, rebellion, it's intervention. Who's intervening? God himself is intervening. God adds flesh over his deity and comes to earth and lives the perfect life in our place. He intervenes because we've rebelled. And he intervenes and he goes through all of this until he actually puts on human flesh about 2,000 years ago. And because he has done all this work for us, now it's our job to tell other people about it. So, that's what we did the past couple of sessions. And the last session we also said that when Jesus is... Uh, on the road to Emmaus with his disciples. They don't recognize him. This is from Luke chapter 24. And uh, he says, why are you guys so dejected? He, they say to him, don't you know what happened in Jerusalem? Are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what just happened? Ironically, he was the only one who did know what just happened. <laughs> that he died and was resurrected. And they're all depressed. And he rebukes him and says, don't you know all the scriptures were about me? And then it says, from Moses to the present day, he explained how all the scriptures were about him. Now, we don't have any of that conversation. But we said that Jesus is the focus of the entire Old Testament. We talked about appearances, how Jesus sometimes shows up as the angel of the Lord. We talked about events, how in sacrifices, Passover, feasts, those kind of things, Jesus is seen through those events, through those sacrifices, through feasts. We saw how Jesus is seen in types in the Old Testament. People like Noah, Isaac, Moses, David, Samson, Jonah, Hosea. We went through some of these people. And we said elements of their lives foreshadow Jesus' life. And then last time we talked about how Jesus is in the Old Testament, also in prophecy. Let me just go over that really quickly for those of you that weren't here. We say there are several passages in the Old Testament that zero in on Jesus. These messianic prophecies. The first messianic prophecy is Genesis 3.15. Right after the rebellion, the fall, the intervention begins. And the first prophecy is that there will be a savior born of a woman. Genesis 3.15. This savior will come from the line of David, Jeremiah says. He will be born in Bethlehem, says, says Micah. He will be both God and man, says Isaiah. He will visit the temple. The Lord you seek will suddenly come to your temple. Remember? The Italian prophet, Malachi. Okay, Malachi. He will come to the temple, which means what? If, if, if that scripture is going to be true, when must of the Messiah come? Prior to what? Prior to 70 AD, because the temple was destroyed and has not been rebuilt to this day. So if he's going to come to the temple, it had to be prior to 70 A.D. Also, this Messiah would die in 33 A.D. When we went through Daniel last year, we went through all, of that, all those calculations done to say 33 A.D., even if it's just close, 30 A.D. That's a very good prophecy. And then, of course, Isaiah 53, we read last time, that this human being will be a sacrifice. This, this Savior, this Messiah will be a sacrifice. Now... Who do you know in the history of the world who was born of a woman from the line of David in Bethlehem who was both God and man who visits the temple, dies in 33 AD and is a sacrifice? The only person that fits is Jesus. So we covered that last time. Now I have a question for you guys. And 
we're going to talk about what's the Bible about. We have to talk about what are the essentials of Christianity. Remember, one of your reading assignments for this uh, program is Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. What are the essentials that Christians who believe the Bible all believe?